So um, first of all, hi, Kyle. Thanks for coming. Uh, congrats on releasing Momo. The video is very, very fun. It was funny to see you Thank all you. in Seattle doing Seattle things. Um, just a quick introduction. Um, Kyle is a lead scientist in the Allen Institute for AI. He worked on many things before large language models became a hit, but recently uh, AI2 is also developing uh, large language models with the focus of I guess you call it like radical transparency, meaning releasing all the data, the code that was using the model weights and so on. Uh, and Kyle in this effort has particularly focused on the data efforts and he's behind the largest open data sets for language model pre-training pre -training to date. Uh, people who do this are like unicorns. There are just so few of them. So I'm super grateful he will uh, give us um, perspective on the pre-training data that comes from someone who actually does this and uh, looks uh, looks at this. Okay, Kyle, so here's the thing. We have few, we have a bunch of people in the uh, audience here in the room. Unfortunately, I can't show it to you. Um, or maybe I can if I do this. I don't know to... To what extent I would be able to see do either some share thing. Okay, hi everyone. Okay, perfect. Okay, you I can see some. And there are a few people on Zoom as well. And um I will take care of the questions in the room. If I see someone wants to ask you something, I will uh, interrupt you because it's gonna be hard to hear uh everyone. Okay, I guess we can start and one thing I haven't been thinking about is the audio. So let's see, can we can we hear you? Yes, one, two, three. Is this okay? Is, does everyone hear people who are in the back? Okay. Yeah, seems like this is good. Okay, cool. Please interrupt me at any time if you can't hear. I know okay, I'm cool. pretty quiet. I hope this is the right class number. I couldn't quite tell if this is it. But hi, everyone. Kyle. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about data curation for, for pre-training. Um, let me just, uh, kill my stop share and then I guess you can share your screen. Okay. Okay. Oh, we don't see your slides if you have them. If you don't have them, that's fine. Oh, uh, can you not see my screen share? Uh-uh. No. Can you try again? Maybe the problem was that I was sharing. Let me try again. Oh, okay. how is this? Oh, yeah, that that's perfect. Thank you. Great. Okay. Cool. Um. So, uh, there's a lot of material. I'm probably not gonna cover all of it. So we'll, we might skip around. Um, for stuff. But and please interrupt if there's questions. Um. But yeah, data for pre-training. So really, um, kind of want to tee this off with this idea of like open language models. Um, this is a term that people have been talking about for a while around openness. Um, and what I want to pose is this question around like, how open are these open language models? So uh, if you look at open examples of models that have been called open, uh, you'll notice that there's examples of some of these models you might have known, but you'll notice that many of these open models have uh, the downloadable weights, um, some inference code so you can actually run the model on your machines and maybe like a paper Sorry, what's going sorry on. Kyle, to interrupt. It seems like it's not like I'm uh, sharing the audio from my laptop and it seems like it's not loud enough. Give me just a moment. Okay. To try to click a few things such that we project it somewhere else. In the meantime, okay. I'm not hearing, try to Mike. Oh. oh, that's what you meant. Sorry. Yes, one, two, three. Oh, wow. This is great. Okay. Is this good? Is this oh, work? it's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, nice. Um, so yes, openness. Um, when people talk about open models, often it's about open weights. Um, and what I'm trying to gonna convince people about is that we need to care about open data. Um, so you'll see a lot of these models that are considered to be open don't necessarily have the data associated with it. So just kind of going through time, almost the model that we're developing, but just going through time, you'll see a lot of these more and more models being released, but Actually, if you strictly just look at which models come accompanied with the data that you use to train the model, um, there's still not a lot of these. Um, so why do we need the data? Like, why is it important to have the data when you want to study these models? Um, and Dolma is the data set that, that um, I've been curating with my team. 
Um, I'm going to give you a story. And the story is the microwave gang story um, to motivate why you should care about data. So this is a these are logs from a typical pre-training run. When you do your pre-training, um, usually the models will like your node might crash, you might have to spin it up again. That's why there's a whole bunch of these. But technically, this is just the same pre-training run continuing. And this is a plot of the loss. And as you expect, the loss is going down over time as you train on more data. Um, so this seems like good. But what are all these spikes? Um, the spikes are the, are the heart of the story of this microwave gang story, um, loss spikes. What does this have to do with microwaves? Well, if you actually inspect what's going on each time the loss spikes up, um, which is bad behavior, um, you'll notice that some of the data looks like this. And so one of those batches, actually the green one back here, if you actually go in to look at the data that caused the loss to go up really high, we found documents which are just Reddit posts from people in the subreddit, where in this subreddit, the rules are you can only post mm, and then people can put reply with beep. Uh, so it's like a microwave. Um, but like this causes extremely weird behavior uh, and when you're training a model. And so a lot of these types of strange sequences, strange uh, data elements um, can cause instability in your training run, which can destroy your entire run. Um, here's some more examples of bad data. Um, bad data can cause you uh, partway through training, your loss, training loss just starts going up. This isn't development loss. This is training loss. Um, can just start going up and it's irrecoverable. You can try different types of interventions, but as long as you're still training with that data, it, the loss will just keep going up eventually. And you might discover this very late in your training. Um, here's another example of uh, a model that under previous configurations of the data and the training and the modeling code, um, it was doing well on this benchmark called MMLU. Um, but for some reason, this blue run, it just could not figure out how to do this task, um, no matter how much you trained it. And we've figured out in the data, it's because we accidentally removed one type of sentence periodically, like as a bug in our data set, and it completely destroyed this training run. So you really need to care about the data um, because training runs are expensive. So this is how much it costs to pre-train uh, one of these models. Um, H H100 is a GPU, costs about, let's say, $3 an hour these days um, to train a 1 billion parameter model or a 7 billion parameter model um, up to the num number of tokens worth of training that people are expecting these days. A failed training run because of one bug in how you process the data can cost you $100,000, $200,000, $500,000. Um, for much larger models, they can take $6 million before you identify the issue. Um, so these training runs as a result of failed data are extremely costly. Okay, so hopefully data, it's important to care about because they have actual implications on your training. So there's three topics uh, that we think about when we're curating data and everything is cat themed. So hopefully that makes things more interesting. Um, we have acquisition. So how do you literally go and get the data and put it onto your machine? So it's kind of like going shopping for your data. Transformation which is you're cooking the data. So like you got to change the data in some way. And I'll describe what that looks like. And then you have to like experiment on the data or like use the data. So this is like tasting the data that you've cooked up. Uh, you have to actually train a language model on it. And so these are the three big themes that you would kind of, we kind of work with when we're thinking about data from language models. Acquisition, just, just get the data. Um, this is a quote that someone at like, uh, uh, someone who worked at um, a, high-performance computing company uh, said to me once at a conference, which is like, just train on the internet. There's plenty of data out there. Um, and this, I'm going to, let's let's think about this. Where do you actually get data to train one of these language models? One of the biggest sources is public APIs and bulk dumps. Um, so let's look at every single data, uh, major data set that has been behind some sort of language model in the last couple of years. And where are they getting their data from? Often, they're getting their data from sources like Common Crawl, the Internet Archive, Software Heritage. Uh, OK, so these names appear a lot. Um, other places that you might have heard of, Archive, PubMed, Wikipedia. OK, um, I think I know what some of these are. Um, let's actually break this down. Turns out that 80 to 100% of the data comes from web scrapers. Uh, if you just count word by word, like a number of words uh, contributed to data. These all come from nonprofits 
that have existed forever and have been doing this web type of web scraping and being released, releasing this data publicly um, for research, academic, nonprofit usage. User provided content, like your messages and something, less than 1%, very, very small amounts of contributions. Um, and I'm already even including Wikipedia and archive, which I consider to be user contributed because you write the paper, you post an archive, you've contributed this. Um, if you're actually talking about like user messages, extremely small percentage of data. And the last final 5% or so, maybe uh, open publishers. So PubMed, Project Gutenberg, Semana Scholar, these are groups that basically maybe own the data because they acquire the data, they have the license rights, and then they decide to make this available programmatically. Um, so all in all, it seems like web scraping is the number one driver of data for usage. Uh, what about all these other things? Um, turns out all these other things are actually just names of other data sets. So data remix, reuse is very, very prevalent. And over time, as you go to the right-hand side, you'll see that the same names keep popping up. Um, in fact, what makes me wonder is like, are we just reusing the same data constantly year after year? Or like, are there any new data sets? Um, not really. This is the only example of a data set that was actually completely novel in the recent years where they went and crawled the data themselves. And this is tiny. This is less than 1% of the data, like less than like 0.1% of the data. Um, so people aren't creating new data sets. Um, they're really just remixing or they're borrowing from the same four, three entities um, that have been doing this for decades. Well, why don't people just go get more data? Why, why aren't people creating more data? Um, this is how you create data. Uh, when you crawl, you have to decide, are you a domain specific crawler? So I'm gonna go like, ah, this type of website is really good. I'm gonna just eat this website. Or are you a broad crawler? I want, I don't care about specialized websites. I want every website, as many websites as possible. Um, well, let's say in either camp, um, to actually get the contents out of web websites, um, you have to look, you encounter a lot of websites that look like this, uh, where you have to click on something uh, that's in, and then the JavaScript has to, basically you have to actually render the page, interact the page to actually get at the content. And if you don't do this, um, you miss most of the content. You might just get this little white piece as opposed to the pink piece, which is the piece that you actually wanna train on. So crawling is actually really, really complicated. In fact, crawling for the most part is writing a lot of JavaScript parsing code that tries to get all of this content out from these complex websites. And this has to be done for every single website independently. An example of this is, this is from our own internal notes. Each row is a website that we assessed whether we should spend time crawling. And so you could look at the types of things we consider. Um, we consider, is this a good website? Like, is this like an educational website with a lot of interesting materials? Or is this like kind of like a random span website? Um, but not just that, even once you've decided that this is a good website, you might not be able to get a lot of content out of it. How, many, how much content is actually on this website? How difficult is it to actually write the parser that coaxes all of this content out of it? Um, how much coverage of the website can you get? So a big problem, for example, is uh, comments. You'll probably see like websites with forums and stuff, and you have to click next to just load the next comments. You have to write specific code to be able to do that. And this makes it extremely, extremely hard to, to, to do crawling because either you're writing very, very specific code so you can actually get the domain specific websites, but then it, you have to do this for every single website. Um, this is impossible. You need teams of people, each one tackling their website, or you're doing this broad thing. And if you're doing this broad crawl, hitting as many websites as possible, you're basically getting very little information from each site. And so unless you have really, really deep expertise, like decades of expertise doing crawling, you're probably not getting anything very particularly interesting. So this is the, the conundrum that you're in if you're trying to collect new data. So this is the worrisome thing uh, for people to think about. Um, this is my worried cat uh, that I'll, I'll include occasionally. Um, crawling is getting harder and harder. Um, other than just the technical expertise and know-how to crawl, uh, websites are actually shutting down access to crawling. Um, there's more and more websites that have specific terms of service or other technical blockers. Um, so this is a plot that basically says over time, as the red increases, the red is basically restricting crawling of websites for AI purposes. So a lot of the high quality content 
that maybe one year ago was used to train a lot of these proprietary language models um, because they were crawled in. Today, you can't access about 25%, 30% of that content anymore. So the space for how much data you can you, you can have access to to, to, to to do language modeling is shrinking. And so a lot of these nonprofits that are providing data are also under a lot of lawsuits. Um, so the question really is like, if you have to pay for data, um, because that's the basis of a lot of these lawsuits, maybe what we're think the issue isn't that we're running out of data to train AI, we're running out of open data to train AI. So this is like a, th a future thing to think about as we think about data acquisition. Cool, I'm gonna move on, but are there any questions? Questions, anyone? Kyle is friendly, don't be afraid. I'm friendly, yes. <laughs> okay, there is a question. So cool. how the data is being restricted specifically? Like, are people just saying they're not allowed to use our data? Are they doing something that's preventing, you know, like the access to the data? How is it being restricted? Did you hear that? Should I repeat it? Can you, yeah, can you can you translate it? Yeah, repeat the it. The question is, how exactly is um, a, a, the access restricted? Like, what is done to restrict it? Ah, okay. So the way access is restricted, there's a lot of different techniques. Um, websites can put up a robots.txt file that basically restricts which pages or even the whole page as like, uh, please don't crawl my site. Um, they might have terms of service pages that say, please don't crawl my site for AI purposes. If you use my site, you agree to these terms, which are don't crawl my thing. Um, so those are soft blockers. Um, they're basically like, if you're a nice player in the space, please don't do these things. And most people try to respect it. There's technical blockers, which are companies like Cloudflare that basically detect uh, based off traffic going to the site. Ah, this is scraping behavior and they'll block that IP or they'll... and uh, depending on which provider is doing this, they could block wholesale like all IPs across this band on, on AWS. So no machines from this from this region can can reach it. Um, so those are technical barriers. And then there's like these other implicit technical barriers, um, not because of AI, but because the age that we're in, websites are getting more and more complicated. And so you might design your website to be you can't get access to the content unless you log in. Or as you scroll down the page, suddenly a pop-up shows up. And then you have to click all these pop-up and do this all login and click next a bunch of times to then get access to it. And that's a soft technical barrier because it's not directly anti-bots or anti-scrapers, but just me as an individual researcher, I have to spend more time writing the code to deal with this. And so implicitly it blocks scraping access. Does that make sense? Yes. Other Sweet, questions? okay. There's just one more question, if that's okay. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So this block, uh, blocking the access to the websites also affect the visibility of search engines? Does uh, blocking the website uh, affect the visibility of that website in search engines? Ah, yes. Uh, so that's super interesting. We don't know yet. Um, there's some articles out right now that uh, basically are speculating, yes, um, if you block Google, let's say, from scraping your website for, for, for AI, um, do you also rank lower on search results? Um, and so there's a little bit of a, a conundrum here where websites might feel pressured to not block Google's bot um, because they don't want their search to also go down. Um, in theory, you can specify, I don't want my site to be crawled for AI training purposes, but I do want my site to be crawled for search indexing. Um, but in practice, does it actually manifest as, do people respect those distinctions? Um, is it feasible to respect those distinctions? We don't know yet. It's like extremely new area of, of poking around. Thank you. There's, there there are no more further questions. <laughs> All right, time to cook the data. Okay, so transformation. We're gonna cook some of this data. Let's assume that we got through all the crawling issues and you maybe went to one of these providers, you download data, you put it on your machine. Um, the number one thing that people think about when they think about data is all of this junk that's it, that's in the data. Um, the, the, on the internet, if you've been on the internet, you know there's a lot of stuff that's low quality. Um, I would consider some of these examples here 
as pages that are low quality. And I sort of define quality in this sense to be stuff that you don't really engage with. Stuff that isn't like long prose that's worth reading and is interesting. These are navigational tools, right? This points you to the content that you then want to actually read. It's so this type of stuff often you don't necessarily want to train on. Uh, this thing that th these these uh, meme websites uh, um, probably also don't want to train on these. So I would consider these low quality. Um, but there's also other stuff that's maybe not necessarily low quality wise for training a language model, but undesirable. Like you just don't want to train uh, on this. And this could be toxic text on the internet, not safe for work uh, content like pornography. Um, also personal information. If you're on the internet for long enough, you will find people's like social security numbers, passports, et cetera. Uh, all of these are um, legally having and disseminating this data can be, can be very tricky. Um, and so people, who develop language models will try to identify this type of content and filter this out as well. Uh, and then duplication. Like these are just four examples of the US constitution that appears in our data. I think we have like hundreds of thousands of copies of the US constitution across different websites. You don't, practically speaking intuitively, you're like, I probably don't need that many copies. Um, do I need more than one copy? Maybe, but probably not hundreds of thousands of copies. So some notion of getting rid of duplicate data um, is, is useful as well. All of these, these are just in the spirit of here's my giant pool of data and I want to throw some stuff out. That's not worth training on or undesirable to train on. Um, there's a topic that people don't think about. So let's look at step through it. Um, that's the goal is to, is to do this type of cleaning. The first stage of any sort of cleaning is what we call linearization. Linearization is how you take the data that you see on the left-hand side and turn it into the thing on the right-hand side. And so practically speaking, what does this look like? Oh, well, you can see the title of this article shows up in text on the right-hand side. The content of this article also shows up, but actually all this, all this extra other stuff, like ads, the navigational toolbar, um, all these other things, this also shows up. And if you just look at this text document on the right-hand side, you can't tell the difference between when the content starts and when like the content stops. And it's actually just some other stuff. Um, linearization is basically deals with this issue of just like, how do you take a web page or a document that's formally usually consumed in this two-dimensional manner um, because we're we, we approach things visually and flatten it into a one-dimensional string. That's what language models see. Um, other examples of like parsing. So linearization uh, looks like this. The same article uh, can, after you take the HTML, uh, the web page, and you basically strip out all this extra code and all these other JavaScript and stuff like that, it could look like this under one tool, or it could look like this under a different tool, same article, or it could look like this under another tool, same article. Um, different parsers will keep around different elements within this type of within these web pages than others. And so this type of cleaning can have can result depending on the tool you use can have drastically different essentially document representations uh, and training a language model on any of these will give you very different results and behavior. So example here is sentences are broken up. There's a lot more ad spam under this under this tool. And so your language model trains a little bit less stably. Uh, so that's linearization. Let's say that we figured out, we tried a whole bunch of techniques and we figured out the magical way to take my fancy 2D web page that I've crawled and saved and linearize it into a string. Once I have a string, um, this is how I, how I approach data. I basically take my string, I transform it in some way, and then I run an experiment. And so to transform, um, you apply all of these operations in the transformation. You can basically filter things down to the language. So I only want English or I want English and Chinese or et cetera, but I don't want these, I don't want Russian for uh, maybe if that's if that's the goal. Quality, so all those other notions of like, ah, I don't want web spam, but I do want blog posts. Um, you can define your quality filters, safety filters, et cetera. And this is roughly how these things look. So this is a document that was crawled and has been linearized. So this is how it looks like after linearization. And you can train a small model, like a linear regression model, fast, like a linear regression model that takes in this string, this whole string and classifies it. You can also 
loop through every single new line in this and classify every single one of these um, for English or quality or grammatical or whatever. Um, and if you define your software to, be, if you define your pipeline to look like this, you can basically create these types of files. Um, you can basically say, hey, uh, what language is this document? Well, if I classify the whole document from basically character zero all the way to 700, the whole document is English. If I run my language ID uh, for every single line, then it will say line one is English, line two is English, line three is English, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is it grammatical? Well, again, I can do the same thing. Check every single line. Uh, that first line was kind of weird. It's like the header text. Second line is kind of weird too. It's like some boilerplate. But the third line, that's the start of a proper sentence. Um, so yes, it's true. It is grammatical, et cetera, et cetera. Continuing on from there. Is it duplicated? Again, just check. You can maintain a set, like a data structure off on your own, loop through all your data and each time, and just keep checking your data against what you've seen before. Each time you've seen it, or maybe under some fuzzy match threshold, you can just be like, ah, it's like a 90% match to something I've already seen or an 80% match to something you've seen, et cetera, et cetera. So when you think about data curation, you basically think about it as I want to take my document that's been linearized, chunk it into strings or just treat it as one big string and run linear models on each one of these chunks to score something, to classify something. And then you create this complex file of essentially signals or little clues or whatever about what's going on in, in your document. And then when you assemble your finite data set, you prescribe some sort of rule. You basically say, I want my data set to be all the documents that have higher than 50% in English score and these lines, uh, here's a threshold for how grammatical it can be. And you know it can be duplicated, but not more than 20 times, et cetera. You can calculate this type of, you can impose this type of rule um, based off essentially as long as you have pre-computed a lot of these signals or features or however you want to think about what these things are. This is extremely in the weeds, but this is this is how a lot of people implement their 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 transformations. And how custom is this? How do you go about doing this? So um, I would think about it as every single data source requires its own particular focus. So if you were trying to do this on GitHub, you might define a pipeline that's like, I'm going to check, filter out, uh, keep only <laughs> the Python Rust languages, but no JSON files. I'll keep Java, but I'll throw out C. Um, you define your quality filters because some people upload weird things to GitHub. And then maybe you'll do some filters that identify like email addresses um, uh, and remove, remove them. But if you're doing this on web documents, then you maybe you don't care about programming language. You care about natural language, like English language versus non-English language. You care about quality filter rules that are more about junk and spam rather than, let's say in, in GitHub, you maybe you're separating code from someone uploaded a Excel sheet just like to GitHub and, and I don't want to filter that out. So think about it as every single data source you consider, you have to basically treat it as a completely separate project. How much filtering happens? Um, this is an example. So common crawl, we took common crawl, we did a whole bunch of the filtering and to finally get to what we trained on, we did like a 65 time reduction of the amount of data. Um, nowadays, I think we're seeing 100 times, 150 times reduction. Um, you really, really have to throw out basically most of your data to, before you train on it. Um, otherwise, your model won't end up being very good. Um, how do you do this? Well, well, this is a large amount of, 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 of engineering. And so the way that we sort of think about this is actually, if you're a very good engineer, like a very good software engineer, data work is like very, very suitable for you. Um, for us, good engineering allows us to try more things. And, and, and so um, a lot of data work depends very heavily on people who can implement very fast and efficient code, maybe in languages that aren't just Python, like Rust, um, ability to scale these types of processing operations to large distributed clusters, not just on your laptop. Um, and this is the implication of good engineering when you do data work. If you want to try one algorithm for deduplication, uh, good engineering work can maybe keep this operation fairly cheap, fairly fast. Um, I only have to wait 12 hours. Hello? 
Sorry, if you are speaking over the speaker, please mute yourself or maybe I can wait. wait. Sorry, Kyle, let me let me find how to mute. Uh, no problem. Yeah. Okay, should be good now. Sorry about that. Okay, no worries. Yeah, good engineering basically allows you to run, try things out, get a wait a day to get a turn on time and caught it's things are pretty cheap. Um, we had an early implementation of this where the same algorithm implemented a different language um, basically took us like three weeks to run. Um, so you can think about it as the better engineering you can do, the more things you can try. Kyle, quick question. The, the duplication yes. is uh, also a linear classifier on top of each example or is it some other algorithm? Ah, yeah. There's a whole bunch of different techniques for this. Um, I don't have perhaps like different algorithms for this, but deduplication can happen at multiple scales. And I re re recommend thinking of it as a multiple scale operation. So an example is for web documents, we do a first round of deduplication that just checks the URL. Like how many times do we need to crawl this one website and this one page? So what we do is we just maintain like a set of strings, which are just like the hashes of the URLs. We do a linear pass through every single document, just check the URL against this thing and throw it out if it's the second time we see it. And that reduces like 80% of the data. Then you could do all these other things, but eventually we'll do another round of deduplication, which basically checks paragraph by paragraph. You can take each paragraph, turn, hash the paragraph, um, and do an exact match check. This deals with a lot of web spam because you'll see a lot of the same auto-generated text, repeat, repeat, repeat everywhere. Um, so like terms and conditions, um, a lot of like copy pasted, like news articles that just repost each other's news article things. You can just like get, get, just get one copy of it and throw it out. Um, and recently people have been doing things like near fuzzy matches. So that's when you'd like take the, take the paragraph and turn it into more like engram features and storing it and then hashing or hashing those. And then basically checking against like some level of engram match as you as you make pass. And then that requires you to find a threshold like, oh, if it's over 70% match in terms of engrams, I don't care about it. Keep only things uh, that are sufficiently different. Does that answer the question? Yeah, totally. And then you mentioned some linear models. Does this mean that each paragraph in your pre-training data has some kind of embedding representation that enables you to train a linear model or do you deal only with this unigram by gram features for linear? Yeah. Yeah, so um, early on, we basically did unigram by gram features um, because of scale. And really everything is driven by the need to process this scale of data, um, this level to get to like this level of cost. And so there's a lot of very powerful tools that are out there. I can give you an example of this. Uh, here's examples of just like stuff that's filtered out. But let's say this, if you want to remove... Um, if you want to classify things like phone numbers, email addresses, et cetera, you could use a more powerful tool. Presidio is a Microsoft tool for identifying these things. And it is empirically more powerful uh, under evaluations, more powerful than writing regular expressions, but it's way slower. And it's slow to the point where we basically just can't use it because we can't scale. And so a lot of reasons to use linear models isn't because they're the best, but because they're the most practical or to use regexes and rules is because they're more practical. And the more compute like way you can like somehow, if you find a way to use a 7 billion parameter language model or a much fancier embedding technique, if you can find a way to scale that and make that compute really fast, um, then it opens up. Actually, I can use these types of these types of models for filtering and they're better than my regular expressions or my linear models. Um, but that's fairly new, new space. Got it. And I guess I'll have a few questions. Maybe let's start with this one. So it sounds like a lot of this pipeline have like thresholds and other hyperparameters. And it sounds like it can be really expensive on these experiments. So how do you write uh, hyperparameters? Yeah, so experimentation, because it's expensive, right? This is perfect. I will talk about that. Um, uh, maybe I should just jump to that. Is that is that all right? Yeah, and then we can come back to your question. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. Oh, is there another question? Actually, that's a whole other section. Is there another question? Wanna say tower? So, uh, they're doing 
Gotcha. Uh, should I repeat this one? Yes, I can hear that one. Yeah, so uh, when you find that the paragraph is actually a duplicate of something else, do you throw out all other paragraphs that make that document? Uh, and if, mm -hmm. you, if, you're not, if you just throw out a single paragraph, does that affect the language modeling abilities? Um, because now there is a, basically you dropped one piece of information and there is some kind of, um, you know, it, it's, um, it's missing something. This is a great this is a great question. Um it's very tricky. So when you throw out paragraphs um and you find deduplication, I th think of deduplication as actually two separate operations. Um in the same spirit as this, which is to separate what it is that you're identifying, identifying that there's something there, separating from what you actually do with that information. So with deduplication, um I think about okay, let's find matches maybe within a document across all, the, all these documents, but then you have to experiment and try different ways of using that information. There, for us, the way we do go about it is if enough of a document is duplicated with another document, we will throw out the whole document because of the reason that you described. Like if you just segment that out, then the whole document, the remaining document doesn't seem coherent. So we throw, we just throw the whole thing out. And that's for like a high level of du duplication. Within a document, you, if you see the same paragraph repeated every single page, sometimes that's just like an ad. Um, and so I don't even keep one copy of it. I remove that paragraph everywhere within that document. Um, so it's almost like digital vacation as a way of identifying that there's some quality issue. So do you call that deduplication or do you call it quality filtering? That's that's dependent on how you act on this identified duplicate. Um, so all, all in all is basically you can think about within documents, there's operations you can do once you've identified duplicates. So a lot of it is just clean up. Um, but if you're going to clean up too much of the document, you might as well just remove the whole thing because then it's garbled. Okay. And then across documents, you can think about is identifying this document a whole bunch of times because it's actually just spam and we should remove all occurrences of it? Or is it valuable, but we should keep K occurrences of it, like the constitution or something? Um, or is it actually extremely valuable and we should keep all occurrences of it? We shouldn't act on it just because we identify it as duplicate. It's actually not bad. It's actually good. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. We have okay. two more questions. Do you prefer to go to the uh, answering uh, how to pick the thresholds and hyperparameters or should we take all the questions now? Uh, let's go to that one and then we'll come, we'll, we can come back to the questions then. Yeah. Sounds good. Double check, just double check. Um, okay, experimentation. This is actually a really short, short section, so this is why I think we can just come back for it. So tasting, tasting the thing, the the data. Um, it's exactly. I couldn't see who, who was asking, but it's exactly right. This is extremely expensive. Um, the way that we basically each single configuration of like your threshold, how you stitch your pipeline, whatever. At the end of the day, you have a data set that's dumped on your computer, and you can have hundreds of these data sets, all slightly different, um, emitted from slightly different pipelines, dumped on your computers. And how do you know if it's good or bad? Um, so the way that we have been doing things is we run what we call data ablations, which is fix the model code, fix the model architecture, fix the training strategy, et cetera, point it to these two separate data sets, run them on the same hardware, and measure how good that eventual language model is. And so you can see some examples here you can see some, oh, this purple line is better than this blue line because that's the only difference between these is the data and nothing about, about, about the model. Um, but the question here is, how can you do this efficiently? So we figured out that you can kind of get away with a smaller model, um, so a 1 billion parameter model. And if it's good on a 1 billion parameter model, it's probably still good at the 7 billion parameter or up scale. We've also found that you can run for shorter runs so instead of training for 2 trillion tokens, 5 trillion tokens, the whole thing, train for a little bit, like 150 billion tokens, and stop early once you see that the curves have separated. Um, so, but this is sort of the, the, the problem with that strategy. There are certain types of operations that are indistinguishable under short runs. So if you think about deduplication is an example of this. Um, the effect of having duplicates in your data you can't see it on a, if you subsample uh, your data and train only for a short amount. Intuitively, that makes sense, right? Like you, 
when is the time when you see like, like the effect of the repeat data? Probably much later in your training run. If you just subsample like 150 billion tokens worth of text, the chances are they're all going to be pretty unique. Uh, and so this is an example of like the curves going to work out, but we did we only saw the differences at like a trillion tokens in. And so different operations, you need to have a good intuition around, ah, this is the best cheap configuration um, uh, that I can use. Um, so you can also do this thing that we call scaling loss, which is train a small model, like a super, super small model uh, and see how good the uh, on these on this data and see how good it is. Then train a slightly bigger model and measure it and see how good it is, et cetera, et cetera. And as you climb this ladder in model scale, fixing the amount of data, you'll notice that there's this pattern. And so based on this, can I essentially extrapolate oh, well, I don't need to train my 7 billion parameter model. I see where that, that loss, that performance is going to land. Um, and so that's how you get a level of cheapness. But again, the challenge here is different tasks, different setups. Um, you have to tailor exactly how you do that. Like what is your minimum model, your minimum model size, minimum amount of training that you need to be able to observe these types of clean patterns for each data set intervention type and also each downstream metric. So the tuple really is model size, amount of training, type of data intervention that you're testing, and the evaluation metric that you are hoping to see some difference on. That's the the tuple that you have to basically figure out the right recipe for. Yeah. Does that I, does that just to kind of follow up on that, I guess the amount of compute you have also is a factor, like how many combinations you have to test out, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. And so this has always been the case with empirical machine learning, which is the more amount of compute you have directly correlates to just number of things you can try. Person who asked uh, not, and I think that means the answer is, the question is answered. Well, good call. That's great. Um, I think that's basically it. That was, uh, this is just more stuff about why we need language models. That are open, blah, 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 plug. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we can just go through the rest of the questions. That's good. Let's first thank uh, Kyle and then take questions. <laughs> All right. One thing that I know is happening recently is a lot of the sites that are using AI to track their data, like publish their sites, usually not to good results. So, I'm wondering how does your data like, take that into account to prevent, like, poisoning or like repeats, like AI results. Oh, you mean the AI generations are on the site and how is that taken care of? Yeah, the like AI generation, like reporting about, like, yeah. about generation. Yeah, I'm not sure yet. Um, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure yet that it's like, is if it's a problem or not, and then how so. I think it's definitely on people's minds, but the issue is, uh, if we the worry about AI generated content is like, okay, one, it's synthetic, it's not real. Well, if it's not real, we've always had non-real. We've always had synthetic content on the internet, anyways. Think about like Yahoo Finance compiles like these auto reports of different like stocks every week, and we have millions of these pages forever. That was pre LLMs. And so when we implement these like rules and classifiers and stuff to filter things out, um, that's what we're trying to catch. And so is it substantively different trying to throw those out and suddenly, oh, the source of these is AI generated content. Well, if they were problematic because they didn't pass quality, if, it, if training on it was bad, then we would filter it out too. Um, so, so some part of me thinks, Maybe it's not that big of an issue. Yes, we have to tailor and adapt these models because over time, the distribution text distribution will be different. So I have to retrain some of these filters, but that's always been the case with any sort of, you know, every new entities are formed, text distribution shifts over time. And then some other part of me worries about like, maybe stuff is so weird and undetectable that it causes like collapse in how models train. Um, that I haven't seen a ton of evidence of that, but like, I think people are looking into it. There's a question in chat. Let me read it. All right. The question mm -hmm. is, when performing web scraping, how do you bypass a website capture? For example, some website display a prompt saying, please verify you are human. Um, 
that's the secret sauce. So if you're a polite crawler, you probably don't bypass it. You just give up on that website. If you're an impolite crawler, you do, there's fancy things that I probably can't cover here. <laughs> All right, um, other questions? I have, I guess, uh, one more question. Um, for the language identification tools, there are 7,000 languages. How, what's the quality of these language identifiers and how many languages do we realistically can identify with what you have right now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, language ID, ID classifiers are pretty bad. I think that's just like the NLP community has known about that for a while. Um, uh, what a lot of the research in, in uh, language modeling has been on has been basically English centric focus. So I think the fidelity of these classifiers has mostly been can it reliably identify English language um, and separate it from non English language? Um, that's just like a you know objective prescription. Like if that's what you want to do, then that's a, that's what you rely on these tools for. The thing that we're mm, like gut remembering is like CLD two is not very good. CLD three is decent. Facet classifier is the best. Like these, like you can do empirical evaluations of these. The interesting thing analysis I think is what is English language? So English as spoken around the world or English as spoken by different demographic groups um, can be classified as non-English by these different tools. So one of the evaluations that we try to check is we create a data set of English language as spoken by in Singapore. English language as spoken in India, et cetera, et cetera. And the goal is to see if our English tool, identifier tool, uh, correctly identifies 100% of the time that this is actually English because there are tools that would basically mistaken these as non-English. And so this gives you sort of like calibration, at least if you're just doing English focus. But you probably have to do a very similar, completely separate analysis if you want to do English and Chinese um, or how do you handle, if you want to allow for code switching, um, then you have to design the specific tools around that. I don't really know about those. Got it. Okay, we are at time. So let's thank uh, Kyle one more time. Thank you so much.